Welcome to 2 d Mat, 2D Materials in Tribology. Today, Professor Dr. Robert Karpik from University of Pennsylvania will talk about friction and adhesion behavior of two-dimensional materials. New insights from atomic scale studies. Before we start, we want to thank our sponsors for their support. We are sponsored by the two MDPI journals, Codings and Lubricants, as well as Frontiers in Mechanical Engineering and Arctic Instruments. Good afternoon to everybody. Uh, thank you for joining um, the second webinar in 2022 um, of 2D Mat, uh, 2D Materials in Tribology. Today, I have the great pleasure to announce our speaker, Professor Rob Karpik uh, from UPenn. Um, I think I don't need to introduce him that much because everybody will be very familiar with the world leading uh, expert on nanotribology. Um, Rob has received his bachelor, master, and PhD in physics, the, uh, the PhD from University of California in Berkeley, uh, 1997. Um, as I said, he's an expert in nanotribology, nanomechanics, surface science. Um, he has published more than 240 uh, research papers, uh, reaching more than 18,000 uh, citations with an age index of uh, over 70, if I'm not uh, wrong. Today, he's gonna to talk about friction and adhesion behavior of two-dimensional materials, new insights from atomic scale studies. So a very exciting topic, uh, and we are very much uh, looking forward uh, to your talk, Rob. Great, thank you very much, uh, Andreas and Philippe for uh, the invitation and that kind introduction. And, and thank you also for your leadership in putting this webinar series together. Uh, it's great timing given that these online forums are the ones we are uh, our, our only uh, lifeblood of research interactions for quite some time. Uh, and so I think it, you've collected a very nice uh, set of, um, of topics and speakers, and this is a terrific resource for the community. So thank you for doing that. Um, I'm gonna talk about research we've done looking at uh, friction and adhesion at the nanoscale uh, for two-dimensional materials. Um, we are looking at the atomic scale to try to get fundamental insights and to try to think about applications at that scale. Um, a good chunk of the work I'm going to show you today was done in collaboration with Ashley Martini, who gave a talk uh, earlier in this uh, webinar series herself. So you'll see some things uh, that you may have seen in her talk, but I'll emphasize a bit more of the experimental perspective. Um, her um, postdoc, for, uh, sorry, former PhD student, uh, Mohammed Vaziri Suresh, uh, did a lot of that simulation work. And uh, on our side, the experimental work I'll be showing you um, uh, uh, was uh, done by Catherine Haas, a former student, uh, now at U University of Colorado and uh, on her way to Carthage College uh, to start as a professor soon. So I'm gonna talk about um, three topics. Uh, the first, I'm gonna sort of to set the stage, I'm just gonna very briefly review some earlier work we did on graphene and two-dimensional materials, where we looked at um, layer-dependent friction and I'll talk about an, uh, sort of a, a somewhat more recent update to that uh, involving a, a understanding the mechanism of layer dependent friction. Um, but then I'll get into some newer results. I'm gonna spend time talking about uh, work with, uh, with Ashley Martini, looking at what happens when you change the chalcogen, the, the MOS2 versus sulfur versus selenium versus tellurium. What happens to the friction force at the nanoscale when you change the chalcogen atom in a, a transition metal dichalcogenide? Um, and then finally, I'll show some uh, uh, recently published work on looking at thermal effects uh, in uh, friction and reducing friction by increasing the temperature. So in this first topic, uh, first, just by way of overview, this audience, I think, knows uh, that we have a, a wide range of materials to choose from that are layered uh, both in the bulk, like graphene and molydisulfide. Uh, and which can uh, also be produced as ultra thin 2D materials. And of their many exceptional properties, uh, the tribology is of course interesting because primarily because you have this weak interplanar bonding that allows for easy shear, whether it's graphene or graphene or molydisulfide, there are uh, an increasing number 
and range of uh, two-dimensional and layered materials like maxines, which Andreas has looked at, uh, zirconium uh, phosphide, metal phosphides, for example, and the list goes on. And over and over again, you see this repeated theme of easy shear between layers. And of course, graphite and molydisulfide have been around for a long time as macroscopic solid lubricants, uh, more recently being used as additives in liquid lubricants um, to help promote reduced friction and sometimes reduced wear. Um, and so there are applications from the nano to the macro scale. And one particularly exciting one I want to point out, uh, you all may have been following the exciting developments with the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, this uh, very complex uh, instrument, which as you probably know, is so far away from Earth now, it cannot be serviced. Unlike the International Space Station, we can't send people up there to fix anything. Um, so uh, this has many moving parts and to lubricate parts in outer space that operate at low temperatures in ultra high vacuum with ionizing radiation, molecular oxygen in the lower Earth atmosphere that it travels through, um, you've got uh, serious challenges with trying to keep things lubricated. Molly disulfide based films are um, the key and are used here on most of the moving contacting parts, the bearings and gears that are used to deploy uh, the, the moving parts in this assembly, including the, the fantastic uh, hexagonal uh, antenna array that you see. So, um, so this is a real success story. Uh, and as we move forward, um, we think about the fact that with this whole array of 2D materials, you can combine them and you can do, uh, you can make remarkable electronic uh, and functional materials, but don't forget about the mechanics and the tribology, even if you're talking about an electronic device. Flexible electronics require assembly processes that often involve adhering and de-adhering two-dimensional and ultra-thin layers. And here's an example um, from Air Force Research Lab recently where they could make ultra-thin gallium nitride devices um, and they used boron nitride thin layers as a release layer. They could put devices, grow devices on boron nitride and then peel them off and then place them onto the flexible uh, platform for the application. So when you bend and stretch thin layers, you're going to get high stresses. You may get shears between the layer, shearing stresses between the layers. And so adhesion, friction, uh, and the mechanics all matter. So, so that's our you know, general motivation, applications across length scales uh, from structural to functional applications. But the science is fascinating. And of course, we get very excited when we see things like this. This is just one example from several years ago in our lab showing just how low uh, the friction can be when you have just a single layer of a two-dimensional material. And here, this is work by um, Phil Egberts, who I think is on the line. Hello, Phil. Uh, this is a copper uh, uh, foil with CVD graphene islands grown on it um, that uh, was studied uh, uh, in our lab uh, by when Phil was here. And this is a friction force a map, and you can see very low friction over the graphene islands, high friction over the copper, which has got uh, oxidized. And uh, just this line trace shows this order of magnitude reduction as the AFM tip. I believe this is a silicon AFM tip, um, but whatever tip material you use, sliding over copper, copper oxide really, high friction, order of magnitude reduction when there's a single layer of graphene in between the um, uh, copper and the tip. And Phil measured uh, the friction. Here you can see friction as a function of load. And you see that not only is the friction force lower in absolute terms, it's barely increasing with the applied force, the applied normal force, a slope of something like 0.004. In fact, the, actually, the, statistically, the slope was negative with a, an error bar that meant it was close to zero, basically. So we would say this is an example of super lubricity at the nanoscale through a single layer of atoms interposed between a high friction surface and um, a tip. Nothing special about the tip either. Um, so incredibly low friction that you can get uh, when you do this. Um, so this is the, uh, the first reference is how the um, uh, samples are grown. And, and this is the paper that uh, shows the friction results. So one to two orders of magnitude reduction in friction and friction coefficient. So um, going back a ways, and some of you may have seen this work, this work we published over 10 years ago, uh, but again, just to set the stage, working with Jim Hone, we saw that uh, you, you see this large reduction of friction compared to bare substrates like silica or other materials, 
but the friction is layer dependent. So when we zoom in on an exfoliated flake of graphene that has one, two, three, four layer thick regions, we see higher friction on one layer, lower friction on two, three, and four layers. We see a monotonic increase in the friction force as we go from you know, bulk or four layers, pretty much indistinguishable. But as we go down to a monolayer, the friction pretty much doubles. And, uh, and it's, it's a reproducible effect uh, and quite a strong one. And we see it not just for graphene. We saw this for molydisulfide, uh, niobium diselenide, uh, boron nitride, you always see this monotonic increase in friction between the tip of an AFM uh, sliding over uh, these ultra thin layers on different substrates. So this was a universal effect uh, for ultra thin layers that the friction was always low, much lower than the bare substrate, but increasing almost around doubling uh, when uh, the, uh, as you go down from a few layers to a single layer. So what is it about that single layer? Well, you know, energy barriers matter. This is all, these are all measurements of static friction. And so we think about the fact that as this tip slides over the 2D material, it's sampling a potential energy surface. And that potential energy surface has some corrugation to it. And the tip of course um, is connected to a cantilever, which gives us this spring-like elastic compliance. And actually the contact itself has some elastic compliance. The tip is, uh, in, is uh, elastically indenting the graphene or the 2D material and the substrate below, if there is a substrate, um, could be suspended as well, but there's elastic strain there. And so there's a spring response to that elastically deformed contact region in addition to the spring response of the cantilever. So that's all embedded in this spring here in this simple diagram. So there's a stiffness to that spring there's a corrugation, oops, sorry. There's a corrugation to that energy landscape and there's a lattice constant. And this was this model worked out by Prantl and Tomlinson independently back in the twenties, Prantl being, uh, paper, Prantl's paper being frankly the more comprehensive one. You bind the energy variation of the potential energy surface, the sine wave-like corrugation, combine that with the Period, the uh, parabolic potential energy of the spring. And what you get is an energy landscape that has multiple metastable minima. And I'll, uh, you can see uh, as we pull, uh, the local minimum that we're in gets eliminated as we stretch the spring. We're no longer in a stable minimum statically, so we're gonna slip to the next point. That's the essence of stick-slip friction at the atomic scale. And the model predicts that the static friction force is proportional directly to the corrugation and the, the uh, and inversely proportional to the lattice constant. In order of magnitude, uh, this uh, this works out. You get order of magnitude agreement between the static friction forces you measure, uh, calculated energy corrugations for these materials, and the lattice constant. So, so low corrugation energies uh, is one uh, approach to try to get um, smooth sliding, low low friction. Um, but also notice the lattice constant, sorry, let me go back. The lattice constant comes in there too. Where does the spring come in? The spring comes in in determining if it's stable or not. So a weak spring will give you lots of these multiple uh, energy minima, a weak spring or a, or a strongly corrugated uh, system, and you'll get lots of stick slip instabilities. The friction force will go up. You'll hit the static friction force and then slip, and then you'll get these the stick slip sawtooth the behavior will reverse when you go backwards. And that's your classic friction loop, which has been seen since the early days, the very first days of lateral force microscopy. Now, what was different about the graphene was that, yeah, we could see these stick slip friction loops at two nanometers sliding back and forth or five nanometers sliding back and forth. Um, that's on bulk uh, graphite or four layer graphene. But as we went to three to two to one layer, the friction loop started to tilt and it started to open up. Opening up means more energy dissipation because the dissipated energy is the area enclosed by the friction loop. And this buildup in static friction, it increases for a few nanometers and then levels off. And then you turn around and the static friction in the reverse direction increases in magnitude, levels off. So we saw this friction increase as the number of layers decreased. The friction loops were tilting because of an apparent transient buildup 
of resistance to sliding before it levels off, seen in multiple materials and seen as well by other groups, including early on uh, the first report from Roland Benowitz's group. Um, so we had thought that this was due to um, the fact that the graphene as it gets thinner is more flexible. And if it's more flexible, adhesion between the tip and the graphene or the two, whatever 2D material can help lift it off the substrate and form what we call the puckered structure. So you see this almost capillary-like structure here because of adhesion between the tip and the graphene. The tip we think is somewhat clean. It's sliding around all the time. You keep it clean, you keep contaminants off. The substrate, this is exfoliated graphene. It's not necessarily that clean. Uh, you might have some contaminants in there. You might have a little bit of roughness. So if you have a mechanism by which the adhesion to the tip is stronger than adhesion to the substrate, uh, you can get this capillary forming. And so we did molecular dynamic simulations that were led by Julie's group and his former student, uh, uh, postdoc Suji Lee, or former student Suji Lee, and they saw the same effect, uh, a, a mild effect at four layers, but it, as you go down to one layer, strong buildup in the uh, friction force, this transient buildup and a leveling off, and uh, higher friction overall, and rather good quantitative agreement in the value of the uh, friction forces they got uh, compared to our experiments. However, uh, they checked, is it really true that this puckering is what's causing the increased friction? They looked at how big that pucker was, how big is that extra contact area that you get? And the gray bars here is the contact area for the different numbers of layers according to the simulation. And they only saw a very modest increase in contact area as they went from four to one layers, even though the friction was doubling like it did in the experiments. So they looked more closely and what they saw was that it's not just the quantity of the contact that matters, it's what we call the quality of the contact. How strong are the tip atoms interacting with the atoms of the 2D material? So these are um, color-coded plots of the force that the tip atoms are experiencing. We're looking from the bottom of the tip up. It's a graphene's eye view of the bottom of the tip. And wherever there's contact, you see forces. Some of these forces are resisting forward motion. That would be the positive, uh, sorry, the negative forces. Some of them are actually assisting friction, uh, or sorry, assisting the sliding. Why is that? Well, if one of these atoms is in a local energy potential and it's actually um, uh, uh, on the downhill part of that potential because of where it's located, it wants to keep going downhill, right? It wants to move forward. So the local potential energy uh, environment of one of, the, one of a few of these atoms might actually be pushing them forward. Others are going uphill, there's resistance to motion. But the key point here is there's a tremendously heterogeneous response, a heterogeneous set of forces acting on the tip. It's not a smooth continuum looking like contact. There's big variations in the local environment that each tip atom is feeling. And thus, what matters is the sum of all of these forces that end up, yes, being resistive in total, but there's a lot of variation in the local environment. And they interrogated this local environment, and they could see that for atoms like, here's, here's one particular atom, atom number one on the, on the, on the tip that's isolated here, uh, the silicon in red, the graphene surrounding it. And what they found is, as they slid, there were small changes to the bending and thus uh, the reg direct registry of the silicon atom, of that particular silicon atom in the graphene. And that ended up leading to a rather high local resistive force preventing you know, the forward motion of that tip atom. Other tip atoms were in environments where there wasn't a lot of modification, local bending of the graphene. So here's atom number eight. This one was in an environment that, um, was not modified and uh, as the tip was sliding and the graphene is not providing a lot of resistance to it. So this transient increase that they saw in the simulations and that we saw in the experiments, we believe is not due as much to this increase in the contact area, but due to this increase in locally, in local environments of tip atoms that prevent, um, uh, that resist the forward motion. In other words, 
the flexibility of the graphene, even down to the nanoscale, allows it to help uh, reconfigure and trap the atoms of the tip in deeper energy minima to resist motion. So, so that's sort of the theme I want to get at is how the potential energy surface, not just of the whole tip, but of the local atoms, makes a difference for how much static friction you get. All right, so that's sort of some previous results. Let's think now about how this might affect um, some other systems. So in trying to understand the friction response better, uh, and now we're this is the work with Ashley Martini's group, uh, we started looking at varying the composition of the 2D material. So we can play around in the periodic table uh, with 2D materials, and one of them is to vary with these transition metal dichalcogenides, vary the, ch the chalcogen atom, and we looked at sulfur, selenium, and tellurium. So as we go down the periodic table, you're going to get more and more core electrons, bigger and bigger atoms, all right? So the bonding changes, the potential energy surface might change, um, but also the lattice constant changes, okay? And the mechanical properties change. So we're tuning a knob, but changing a lot of properties. The thing we're not changing is the fact that these are stable materials and that they can be um, uh, grown as in, in two-dimensional form, okay? So we did, uh, oh, a quick comment. The molybdenum ditelluride, that can oxidize, so you have to be a little careful. But we do all of our experiments in ultra-high vacuum. So uh, the samples are grown by Charlie Johnson's group at, at Penn uh, by CVD uh, for the sulfur and uh, sul sul sulfide and selenide. Uh, we also uh, uh, got bulk samples of uh, the sulfur and the sulfide and the selenide and the telluride uh, commercially. So they're grown uh, or exfoliated, uh, exposed to air at that point, but then put in ultra high vacuum, annealed in vacuum uh, to minimize contamination. And, and then we do the sliding experiments. We do it at room temperature. We do it with no additional applied load. The only load between the tip and the sample is due to the adhesion forces between the tip and the sample. And we do molecular dynamics, actually Martini's group does molecular dynamics simulations matching as best as possible, the substrate material, the 2D material, the tip material, the tip size. Um, in their case, they did increase the applied load somewhat. This um, uh, helped give higher friction forces to get better signal to noise, um, but we did, do experiments at different loads, and we don't see any fundamental difference. So we believe it's it's a, it's a uh, the qualitative comparison that I'm going to show you is still valid. I'm also going to show you some application of this Prandtl Tomlinson model, where Ashley's group uh, worked with others to come up with a code, a numerical code to simulate sliding with a given potential energy surface, um, with not just a single 1D sine wave, but a 2D surface and springs that. Uh, mimic what happens in the AFM, okay? The samples, uh, Charlie Johnson's group, they're wizards at this, so they can grow sulfides and selenides and many others. They can make heterostructures and, uh, and others. Um, they do um, uh, uh, Raman and red spectroscopy and, they, and optical microscopy, and you can verify the quality of these layers. Uh, and the good news here is there's lots of these little islands, so we stick them in the AFM and we can, we can find them easily enough. Take some effort, but uh, there's lots of them there. So we know we're sliding on the molybdite sulfide and, or selenide, and, and we see, again, the friction is much lower than on the substrate. But how do they compare to each other? So we know, oh well, what we observed by measuring friction forces with the AFM and also through the molecular dynamic simulations was that we saw this um, uh, hierarchy of friction forces. The sulfide had the highest friction force, the telluride had the lowest. We could see atomic lattice images. Um, here we have the friction loops for the uh, MOS2, MOSE2, MOTE2, all at the same load, same tip. We go back and forth and cycle. Um, the tip isn't changing. These differences are robust. Um, the molecular dynamics, similar effects, larger amplitude, um, and higher static friction forces um, seen in the molecular dynamics. We did averages um, looking over multiple tips and multiple samples. And we repeatedly saw uh, for the experiments in the, the monolayers, the sulfide had significantly higher friction than the selenide. 
Um, same thing for the bulk. Uh, the sulfide was the highest, actually it was much higher. There was a, a bigger contrast for the bulk samples than the monolayer samples. Um, so you can see the selenide quite a bit lower, the telluride even lower. We're not sure why there was such a strong contrast here. Um, that remains an open question, but qualitatively, the, the rankings it remains the same. The sulfide had the highest friction. And the, the molecular dynamic simulations reproduce this um, uh, arrangement. So we see this reproducible difference uh, between this family of TMDs. What's going on? Well, so here are uh, simulations uh, from Ashley's group. Uh, the upper uh, plots are the potential energy surfaces of the three samples. So the energy uh, scale is here. You can see it's in milli electron volts from zero in blue to about 330 in red. And the lower uh, traces are showing you the lateral force on the tip. So the tip is being pulled from left to right. And there you can just see a slip just happen on the MOS2. And I hope you can see the trace that the, uh, um, the trail that the tip is following when it finally slips is being traced out in black. I will play these movies again because there's a lot of information here and, and they're all a little different. Um, but uh, this is really fascinating to see. Again, the tip is many atoms and the contact is many atoms in size. The black line that we're tracing is just the position of the center of mass of the tip, okay? So we're just uh, giving, using that as a single reference point like a reference atom so we can plot the position. I'll play those movies again. Okay, so uh, you can see if you look at the MOS2, the tip is sitting in a near a low energy position, um, the center of mass of the tip, not much is happening. The spring is getting stretched, the force is building up. The tip is just sitting here. It's, it's, it's moving a little bit to the right. Okay, it's starting to climb uphill because we are applying a force. So it's gonna, go up the potential energy landscape. Um, but then you can see here, it's moving towards this um, saddle point, right? There's a saddle point between these two potential energy mountains and then the tip slips, okay? And if you look at all of the traces, you'll see the tip is a uh, start. It doesn't go over the tops of the mountains, right? It goes between the, the, the mountain passes, right? The saddle points, the, the lowest points between the two mountains of potential energy. And that's because the tip uh, does have lateral springs in both directions, just like in the AFM. So it can, it can meander uh, up and down and left and right on the surface, right? And it does that um, to minimize the total energy as it uh, passes through uh, from one valley to the next, right? You can see the magnitude of the stick slips and the uh, frequency being different um, uh, in these surfaces. But take a look at the uh, color scale. You can see the spacing between the atoms is different, but notice how the color scale isn't that different, right? So this was our first sort of surprise. The corrugation, right, of the potential energy landscapes for these three materials is not that different, okay? So uh, I should uh, point that out here. Blue is, uh, the, the color scale is the same for all three. So, that delta E that I showed you for the Prandtl Tomlinson model, the corrugation of the energy, it's not that different. We thought that, or we expected naively, that the difference between these materials in friction was gonna be uh, due to a different corrugation of that potential energy surface. Not that different. Um, so why are we seeing such different friction? Well, when we look at their trajectories, as I pointed out, the tip is traversing over these saddle points rather than going over the maxima. Now, this here on the right is a plot of what the potential, just an excerpt of the potential energy surface is where the sliding direction is Bashia, into the cage. Uh, I want to want to say that why you lie, you lie. Oh, I think there's a... Okay, so, there's, so this is a view of the tip, uh, uh, of, the, of the energy landscape to the left and the right of the tip as it's moving forward. So this is a view through the mountain pass, all right? And um, because of the fact the lattice constants are different, um, you have to go further out in distance before, well, the before the telluride reaches the same uh, maximum. Um, 
and and so the locations and the, and the energies right along this trace are a little different, but the maxima are the same, the minima are the same roughly, but you can see the gap, the width of this valley that we're traversing is different. So we got the idea that maybe what's happening is this: we see from the trajectories that the tip has thermal energy. You can see it wobbling. You can see the vibrations due to the um, uh, uh, the uh, finite uh, stiffness of the system. So imagine you're this uh, um, wobbling tip that's trying to make it through the mountain pass. If you're trying to make it through a very narrow pass, that's more difficult. The thermal energy is gonna cause you maybe to hit the sides and it's going to be more difficult. The wider that pass is, in other words, the larger the lattice constant, the more room you have to get through that mountain pass, even as you have thermal energy uh, randomizing your path to some extent. So that was our idea that maybe it's just the lattice constant making this saddle point having a gentler uh, profile that allows us to have lower friction. And so we simulated this effect using this two-dimensional prandtl tomlinson model. So this is the energy. Um, uh, sorry, uh, what we're doing here is we're varying two different parameters. Uh, we're varying the corrugation energy here um, in electron volts varying the lattice parameter here in nanometers. And then the color is showing the static friction that results from the uh, prandtl tomlinson model simulation. And sure, as you increase the energy corrugation, um, the, the static friction goes up. We can see this here on the plot on the right, bigger corrugation, more friction, it's almost linear. That's what prandtl tomlinson predicts. But what if we vary the lattice constant and keep the energy fixed? Right? As we keep the energy corrugation fixed, that lattice constant gets bigger. And we're, this is a big range. We're going from 0.1 to 0.5 nanometers. That's huge. All right? But even within the range of the lattice constants of the TMDs that we're sampling, um, we see that uh, there is still a, a reasonable change um, in that uh, friction force. Okay? So this, we believe, is uh, well, and I should say, and the friction force we get from the molecular dynamics simulations um, uh, is uh, varies in, in by about the same in, within the range that we see in the experiments. So, so again, this is the idea. It's like if you're trying to kick a field goal in football. And sorry for using the American uh, term, uh, version of football here. Um, you kick that field goal. Well, if you've got a high energy barrier, you're going to have to kick high to get over it. Um, so you could lower that and it's going to be easier. So easier field goals, lower friction if you have lower barriers. But you know, when you kick your field goal, you might be to the left or the right. Um, you have, you're not going to be perfectly uh, straight on. And so the wider the goalposts are, the easier it is to score that uh, field goal, right? So that's what we think is happening here, that it is this, this increase in friction or the decrease in friction with increasing chalcogen size, increasing lattice constant, um, is due to the fact that spreading out the atoms uh, makes the energy landscape gentler and we're able to get over those saddle points more easily when we have, despite the fact that we, we're being scattered by thermal energy. Okay, so that's something we published uh, uh, recently um, and, uh, and I think helps reinforce this notion that the nature of the energy landscape, both its corrugation and its um, spacing is important for understanding friction. So it looks like lattice, lattice constant, varying lattice constant can have an effect uh, on the static friction you measure. Okay, the last thing I'm gonna show you um, is uh, a different effect. We're gonna look at what happens when you vary temperature on 2D materials. And in particular, we're gonna use molydisulfide uh, because it's so well-defined and easy to work with. Um, now, this is not new, I wanna point out. Um, very nice, beautiful work done by uh, the Sawyer and Perry group back in 2009 where they measured the friction force using atomic force microscopy on bulk molydisulfide, and also they did graphite, uh, HOPG. And they saw that as they wrote, increased the temperature, there was a uh, dramatic drop in the friction force. Um, they also saw that at the lowest temperatures, they started to get wear and damage at the surface. The friction force between the tip and the sample got so high that as they tried to slide the tip, it would start damaging and shearing the the molydisulfide sample. Um, but uh, I wanna focus on this high temperature effect. 
this dramatic reduction in friction is pretty enticing because the friction is low to begin with, um, but you you can get extremely low friction super lubricity um, by having uh, a sufficient temperature. Um, work from uh, Andre Schermeisen's group uh, and with theoretical collaboration from Michael Erbach's group uh, also uh, show temperature effects on various materials. This is one example. They looked at several materials here, sodium chloride, so not a 2D material, um, but bulk, you know, three-dimensional crystals. Um, they also saw this dramatic reduction of friction as the uh, temperature increases. They did see something interesting here. At the low temperatures, they didn't see where. They actually saw a reduction in friction, and they attributed that to the fact that at the lowest temperatures, there's no thermal activation to promote um, interactions like adhesive interactions between the tip and sample. Uh, a little bit of thermal energy, you start getting some tip sample affinity that increases uh, friction, sort of some sort of local atomic scale bonding, uh, non-specific bonding that occurs. But then with more thermal energy, the thermal vibrations uh, assist you in, and you get this thermal lubricity. And this idea uh, illustrated here comes uh, in cartoon form comes right out of the Prandtl Tomlinson model. The, the version I showed you didn't have any thermal energy in it. I just showed you a static potential energy surface and a, uh, a tip moving through it. But of course, there's thermal energy. And so as we pull, that thermal energy can help overcome that barrier even before the local energy minimum is eliminated. So hopefully the animation translates well on Zoom. Um, you will slip uh, forward before the uh, potential energy minimum is eliminated because you have thermal energy. So this gives you two predictions. One, if you slide more slowly, or two, if you increase the temperature, both of those give you either more time or just more thermal energy for that, that th those thermal vibrations to help you and you get lower friction. And there are equations that have been worked out using these uh, simple models, the simple uh, reduced order model that, uh, and one of them is, this prediction that at low enough speed or high enough temperature, by applying transition state theory to account for the thermal fluctuations, you can reach this so-called thermal drift regime where you get basically a one over T times E to the one over T reduction in uh, friction. So this is a curve that goes down steeply as the temperature goes up, okay? So, um, we thought, let, let's take a look at this um, and, uh, and see, uh, see what we see. Um, so we use a variable temperature, ultra high vacuum AFM. We can go from cryogenic up to elevated temperatures, about 150 to 550K. Um, where the temperature I'm gonna show you is measured right at the top of the sample surface where we mount a thermocouple. So we think it's a, a good measurement of, of the thermal environment uh, of the tip sample contact. We do it in ultra high vacuum to prevent contamination. And we've looked at both uh, bulk um, moly disulfide and CVD grown moly disulfide. One of the concerns with AFM is the tip can change. And so we cycle the experiments. We go up and down and up and down in temperature multiple times. We used multiple tips, silicon, silicon nitride, diamond. We wanted to make sure the trends were robust and we wanted to make sure that the changes we were seeing were not due to changes in the tip or aging of the sample. Okay, so we cycle uh, many times and we um, uh, make sure we, we don't see hysteresis. So there are a lot of, what I'm gonna show you are summaries, but this is involving at least 10 temperatures per data set, 10 speeds at each temperature to look at these speed effects and thermal effects. And so the first thing is, well, we see uh, what was seen before. Friction drops strongly as you increase the temperature. Um, if you want to put it pessimistically, as you go cold, friction goes up. This is a challenge for um, using uh, molly disulfide in, this, in the space applications I mentioned. Okay? This is sliding at 50 nanometers per second. Um, uh, we go a little faster, same trend. Friction's a little higher systematically, just a little bit. All the blue data points are higher than the red for the most part. Um, a little higher at yet higher speed, um, and then even higher speed again. Small increases in friction with speed, but a strong decrease in friction with temperature. Um, these are examples of the friction loops. We do see stick slip friction. It's not the cleanest. Uh, we don't see the sharpest, uh, most beautiful lattice constant contrast that we can sometimes see with 
different materials and, and even with this material. Um, but we do typically see that when you take Fourier transforms of the friction force, it has the periodicity of the lattice. So it is stick slip static friction, not some sort of dynamic of viscous friction. Okay, so these are examples. Uh, the large friction loop is an example at low temperature. Uh, the small friction loop is the low friction at, at high temperature. So there's the temperature dependence at different speeds. Here's the speed dependence at different temperatures. So um, uh, going from low temperature at the bottom to the, sorry, uh, yeah, low, um, high temperature at the bottom here, this is 466 Kelvin at, for the lowest friction values. And then we move up in the different colors to the uh, low temperature, high friction regime. And here's the speeds and here the speed is being plotted logarithmically. And what you can see is there's a nearly, nearly logarithmic like dependence um, to the friction force. This is what you would predict. Uh, and I didn't show the equation, but this is roughly what's predicted from the Prandtl Tomlinson model, a logarithmic like dependence. The solid lines are fits of that Prandtl Tomlinson model where we have used a single set of parameters. We are not allowing the parameters to vary for different temperatures or different speeds. And with a single set of parameters, it's not bad. Um, I think most of these data points, we fit within the scatter. There's clearly a deviation at the highest temperature where Prandtl Tomlinson is uh, too low at the low speeds, too high at the high speeds, but not a bad um, uh, uh, set of fits. You certainly get better fits if you allow the different fitting parameters to vary uh, with each speed or to, with each temperature, um, but, uh, but it's not doing too badly. Um, you can plot these in three dimensions. So, so this is just the friction versus speed and temperature. So again, you can see the very strong temperature dependence and the very modest speed. There's speed in the, on a log scale that we get. So, so that all looks good. But like I said, we wanted to make sure all of this was reproducible. And so for about half the data sets we got, we could see dependence like this. But for the other half of the data sets we got, we saw something like this which looks like a mess, but notice the friction scale. It's only four nanonewtons on the right. The, the scale on the left is 200 nanonewtons. So with similar tips under identical conditions, we sometimes basically see very low friction and it's just scattered around this low value of a couple nanonewtons um, with no systematic dependence on temperature or speed, okay? so. We saw a bifurcation of the behavior. About half of our data sets um, were th showed thermal lubricity um, consistent with Prandtl Thompson. About half of them did not. We scratched our heads over this. We spent, I'd say, a good year and a couple of years. Uh, Catherine was very patient. And um, we did a lot of characterization of the surfaces and a lot of effort to try to understand what's going on. And we, it's very difficult um, to confirm the degree of contamination on the surface and on the tip. But we got a very good hint uh, when Michael Erbach and Astrid DeWine and their very bright uh, research, uh, researcher, Wen Gen Uyang, uh, published this paper uh, a couple of years ago. They put contaminants on a surface and looked at the effect that those contaminants had. And what, when they put these model contaminants on the surface, what they found was that um, you can change, you can go from a thermal, thermal lubric effect. So here, in this case, this is um, at high loads, they could see strong thermal lubricity as the temperature went up. And at low loads, it was athermal and low friction. Um, uh, here's a, and then here's another example. Um, uh, what they're looking at is what happens as you change the number of adsorbates, okay? So with, with no adsorbates or few adsorbates, um, uh, they, uh, uh, they see very little uh, dependence on temperature. Uh, but if you have few adsorbates, you do start getting uh, a strong temperature dependence. Um, so it would appear that the, there is a sensitive dependence to the thermal lubric effect, uh, depending on whether you have contaminants, okay? And um, this harkens back to the first part of my talk. I discussed the fact that on graphene, the local environment and other 2D materials, when you have a single layer of, of, 
of a 2D material, friction can go up because the flexibility of the system allows for there to be trapping of tip atoms in local energy minima. Similarly, if you have extra degrees of freedoms from adsorbates, those adsorbates can help to lock the tip to the sample uh, and to create high friction if you have enough of them. Um, so we think that there may be a strong role of contaminants here. And I should mention this, this general idea is not new. Martin Muser and Mark Robbins uh, first proposed uh, back in the, I think, late 90s, early 2000s, that there can be exactly the strong dependence of adhesion, sorry, of friction, static friction on the presence of contaminants. So we think that that may be playing a role. Um, so for now, we have this conjecture. And what we're working on is to try to understand and quantify that by deliberately contaminating the surface. And the initial results are suggestive that yes, this is the case, but this is still work in progress uh, that uh, I hope to report to you sometime in the future. Um, but to summarize for now, we have verified uh, and reproduced the thermal lubricity effect. What we've also seen um, uh, low intrinsic friction, independent of the tip material, independent of the tip size, um, uh, reproducible uh, uh, multiple times. So we think that this interplay between adsorbate coverage and pinning and temperature uh, is, is playing a role and may be an important factor uh, to consider in thinking about the persistence of thermal lubricity. Um, with that, I'll finish. I will take advantage of having you as a captive audience and mention that uh, myself and Matthew May uh, have uh, written about these topics uh, in, a, in this textbook, uh, the second edition of which, the first edition Matthew authored, and I was very honored to work with him uh, to help uh, update it for a second edition. And uh, this is one resource I can point you to if you are looking for more information about, uh, about the origins of nanotribology. So with that, I'll stop and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Rob, for the inspiring talk. Um, I think it was a very nice overview uh, about different 2D materials, um, starting with graphene, going over MOS2, and uh, all the X family in the end. I, I love the, the the example with with the football. Uh, I think uh, <laughs> that uh, goes very straight to the point. Um, so um, the talk of Rob is open for discussion. So um, I would like to invite you, Ada, um, ask directly uh, to Rob uh, via audio, or you also have the possibility to um, type a question into the chat, uh, and we will be happy to take care of that. So um, please feel free. Yes, if you want to ask your question directly uh, via audio, maybe raise your hand first so that not <laughs> a yeah. couple of people start speaking at the same time. If nobody has a question for now, maybe I can start with one. Um, yeah, Rob, uh, also thank you first. Uh, for my part for the excellent talk it was very, very informatic, very good overview of your work. Thank you. um, in terms of the thermal lubricity, I know you have also done a lot of work with um, yeah, uh, different loads and that you basically can shear off uh, absorbents or hydrogen atoms also from the surface. So if you have these absorbents of the surface and you change the load, for example, going to uh, higher loads, then wouldn't you shear off the absorbance and then basically get rid of these these effects? Uh, yes, I think that's that's a, a great point. Very good question, and I think the answer is yes. And let me pull uh, pull back up. Uh, first, I can say that that was something that uh, Michael Erbach uh, looked at and asked it in their simulation, and so. Um, what uh, and, and, and these plots sort of help illustrate this. And maybe, yes, the one on the left is probably the best one. Um, what they saw in their case was at low loads, they could see low, low and pretty much athermal uh, friction. Um, and what they believed is happening here is they actually had an, a, 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 enough of, a, of an adsorbate layer that the whole adsorbate layer 
um, was incommensurate with the, the tip. So they had incommensurate sliding and therefore they had low friction. But um, if they pushed through at high forces, um, that displaced the contaminants. They got direct contact between the tip and the uh, sample. And now there was commensurability there and that um, led to this high friction. But you can see their high friction, the black line here, it drops off as the temperature goes up. So the implication is actually it's the contaminants that are giving you um, low friction by helping give you an, an incommensurate surface. And, and I, I, I glossed over this. In the previous work of, of um, Muser and Robbins, they showed contaminants can actually um, uh, help increase friction. Uh, mm. But that was a different case. In their case, they had a tip and sample that the tip and sample were incommensurate. So they intrinsically had low friction to begin with. Mm. You put contaminants in there, they act as pinning sites that raise the friction. Here it's the opposite. Here there's commensurability between the tip and sample. They have high friction when it's clean. And when you push through, um, that is uh, reduced by thermal effects or reduced by contaminants that make the surface incommensurate. So in our case, so, so, so that's one possibility for what you might be seeing. In our case, um, we uh, did vary the load somewhat. And uh, I would say we have, some we have some data that does show that a very, uh, increasing the load can um, remove, push away and displace contaminants. Unfortunately, we just could not get enough data uh, to show that trend versus temperature because the higher forces tended to lead to the tip getting damaged or mm. the sample damage. So we, I don't think it's impossible, just that with the, the time we had, we weren't able to get a reliable data set. So I cannot say uh, conclusively that we, we've seen that in the experiments. We have hints of it, but, but not conclusive proof. We did do one other thing. We did deliberately contaminate the surface. So we just leaked uh, a small partial pressure of uh, air, um, humid air into the chamber. And um, we did see that that could have a strong effect on friction, um, but it was also complex. We saw there was a strong sliding history. Uh, so we might displace where we were sliding and friction would change. And so again, preliminary evidence suggested that this effect may be going on. The contaminants can cause an athermal effect, but I'm being cautious and saying, I, I can't claim that we've clearly reproduced that. It's, it's in progress. So we have hints experimentally, but uh, we need to do more work to really okay. nail it down. Yeah, it sounds very interesting. I mean, the, the amount of data you showed is incredible. So I can understand that varying the load <laughs> and increasing I, I, the matrix is... Yeah, I had to let Catherine graduate at some point or else, uh, you know, <laughs> I, I would have had a mutiny in my hands. Sure. But no, she, she, she did a lot of work uh, to get to this point. And, and I think uh, it points the way towards the ne next steps we'd like to take. Very good. I see some, um, there's a, I see a question in the chat and I see some hands up too. So I'll let you decide how you want to manage it. Andreas, we don't hear you, you're on mute. But uh, I only see I only see Phil's hand raised at the moment because I don't have <laughs> all the oh. participants here. So maybe uh, we can start with Phil asking his question. Hello, thank you very much, uh, Rob, for the nice talk and the shout out. Oh. And <clears throat> I did use your text new textbook in the tribology course here in uh, Calgary this year. Ah. So oh, it was. I, I I owe you. I owe you a Canadian beer then. <laughs> it was. I only had two students though, so it wasn't that good. Um, <laughs> the, well, yeah. Anyways, um, no. This this contamination issue looks really interesting because, in a way, kind of. I was thinking it brings together your contact pinning from graphene, and then also maybe th thinking about the mechanisms of nanoparticle lubrication. So do you like? Yeah. What do you think? Um, or do you think there's going to be a size dependence on the the size of the contaminants in the in the tip geometry, or uh, like mm. would you use nanoparticles, or would you rather use single atoms to then change the 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 dirt in the contact? That's a good question. I think I hadn't thought much about nanoparticles in the sense that the tip itself, at least when we have a good tip, you know, is so small that it's almost the size of any nanoparticle we would put in there. So if you had a nanoparticle, I would think you know, as opposed to being sort of something that modifies the interface, 
the nanoparticle would be something you would kick around and play soccer with, play a European football with. Um, but uh, but maybe if you had extremely small, you know, even what sort of you can get one nanometer nanoparticles of different uh, materials like like you know adamantine and some of these other compounds um, or molecules. Uh, I think that uh, I I think the answer is that it would be depend very strongly on the nature of that nanoparticle or molecule and how it interacts how it interacts with the tip how it interacts with the sample and then its its structure if it's a rigid structure or a more compliant structure that can be you know modified by the the high stresses that the tip's experiencing so I I, I don't know what to expect as a trend but I I guess uh, generally speaking. I think the more degrees of freedom you have, um, the more um, uh, likely it is you're going to get variations as you change the temperature, as you change the load, as you change the speed. Um, so uh, I think it's a good question, and it's a very practical one for sure. In real applications, there are adsorbates in air. There's for sure going to be water and hydrocarbons on on graphene and graphite surfaces. Um, and uh, linear hydrocarbons, uh, cyclic hydrocarbons. Um, the schmutz that is on a surface is is not all that well known, and how, but it affects friction and adhesion a lot. So, it's it's definitely worth investigating further. But we, we just haven't looked at it systematically. Thank you. Okay, let's go to the chat maybe, and then no, no, Philip, there are, there are two more hands raised from the audience. There, yeah. but I thought you cannot see them. Switch it to yeah. Okay. Uh, let me go to the chat now. Um, there's a question if you could explain about the preparation basics for 2D, mat 2D materials before AFM ah. characterization for new yeah. researchers. Yeah. So, you know, um, if you have a good collaborator like we did uh, in Charlie Johnson who can grow CVD materials, then that's great. Um, handling those materials, you want to be careful with. They grow them in their CVD chamber. Uh, and then they get taken out, right? So they get exposed to air. So you want to handle those, put them in a container, a clean container as quickly as possible, get it into your AFM as quickly as possible. If you're exfoliating, um, preparing that substrate and then how you do the exfoliation matters. And I would point you to, uh, there, you know, there's a lot of work out there, but since friction is particularly sensitive to contamination, um, I, I would point you in, there's many sources, but uh, there is some work um, by Anansh Duluth's group at UT Austin um, that I'm aware of because her former student, um, Danny Sanchez, is now postdoc in our group. And they worked on improving um, the method of exfoliating 2D materials uh, onto substrates and uh, making it on the one hand easier, but on the other more um, uh, reliable and clean. So there is some work. Uh, so Nanshu Lu uh, from uh, UT Austin, and if you want to shoot me an email, I can try to uh, send you the link to that. So um, good literature out there, and uh, the, the methods are there, but you you do have to take care uh, to keep your samples clean. Okay, then uh, there's a raised hand by Dalia Yablon. I hope I <laughs> pronounced this correctly. Yeah, yeah, that was great. Um, hi, Rob. Thanks for great oh, yeah. talk. I see you. Um, so my question, I had a question on the MOX2, is, I guess is two-part question. Um, and and it, it, a lot, it, it, it was in reference to, um, you mentioned that you made the measurements of zero nanonewtons applied load. And mm -hmm. so I wanted to know how exper experimentally that works, you know, in terms of like feedback and stability. But then the modeling was done at six nanonewtons applied load, and that but you felt that that still applied, like uh, that the you know comparison was still um, okay. So could you just say a little bit more about that? Yep, sure. So in the AFM, we, zero is the uh, new nanonewtons is the applied load. So it means the cantilever is is not uh, bent upward or downward from its you know equilibrium position, but there is adhesion holding the, the tip onto the sample. And um, I don't remember offhand the value of those adhesion forces, but we report them in the paper. And I, I'm, I'm, I, would, I believe they're in the order of 10 nanonewtons or thereabouts. Um, so, so in other words, there is 10 nanonewtons of force that's you know, pulling the tip onto the sample. So it's stable. It doesn't 
It doesn't, you know, fly off. It doesn't uh, pull off. You you can even work at negative applied loads um, stably. You can slide under some tension, but the adhesion still holds you there. You know, the lower you go, the bigger the risk that you know someone sneezes or there's a vibration and the tip pulls off, or you hit you hit an irregularity, it tip pulls off. So yeah, so that's what we used um, in the experiment. Um, the MD simulations. Um, uh, I would have to check to tell you how much adhesion they had. Um, and so, but regardless, it is, uh, it is a different load and, uh, you know, it is, it is a higher load. And so I think the stresses are higher. Um, and uh, I, what, I would say that we expect, or we were glad to see agreement of, you know, right order of magnitude or really within sort of factor of two kind of agreement in, in forces. But I don't expect the agreement to be any better than that because of this, this difference in force. Um, if I believe that the limitation in the MD is you go to lower forces, well, lower normal force, lower friction force, and now this, the signal to noise an issue, you just have to run your simulation for longer, do more averaging. It's not impossible. It just takes a lot more computational time. So I think maybe the harder question is, does it make it, you know, is there a fundamental issue here? Like, is the mechanism potentially changing? Um, you know, we, sh we, we would like to look at different loads in the AFM and different loads in the MD and see if there's differences. I would say we did, we did some work at higher loads in the AFM and we still saw the same contrast. Um, so we, we didn't see any change in, you know, the friction mechanism when we looked um, at higher loads. We just didn't do a lot of that, um, again, because of trying to preserve the tip. So to the extent we have, I have no, we have limited, we have a little bit of evidence to say that it remains a good qualitative comparison, um, but it's it's certainly, you know, fair to, to say that, you know, future work looking at um, how uh, quantitatively things change as you change load, looking at that load dependence is certainly interesting and, and worth doing. Okay, thanks a lot, Rob. Sure. And then there's another question by Teo Cesar. He raised uh, his hand, yeah. Yeah, hi. Uh, hi, Rob, uh, very nice talk. Thank you. Uh, I, I have a question, uh, maybe a little out of the subject, but uh, a little related with the graphene. Uh, it's about, uh, for the case of gra graphitization, um, the graphene could have this graphitization process, and, and this process uh, can be consider considered to uh, the surface and you can correlate it with these studies of the like the uh, like you did here in this in this work so when you when you're saying graphitization are you saying thinking about starting with a solid surface um, that is not graphite or graphene but it gets more sp2 bonds somehow yeah when you have uh, I don't know maybe DLC with high sp3 bonding yeah. and when the process of tribology you transform the surface to uh, sp sp2 bonding yep. and this process you um, maybe I don't know if, if you later of the test of the graphene uh, correlated the bonding of the surface Right. So this is an interesting point. So yeah, diamond is one example. When you slide on diamond and you look, you see surface uh, changes and it turns out some sp2 carbon has shown up. Uh, DLCs, like you mentioned, high sp3 bonded SP, uh, DLCs, you slide on them and you get more sp2. Uh, what we we've actually looked at those materials and generally what we see is, well, you get an increase in sp2 the sp2 is very disordered so we're, we're, we we are a little careful with our uh, the way we word it we don't call it graphitization because it's not graphite it's not ordered sp2 it's disordered sp2 and so we just call it rehybridization right from sp3 to sp2 that said 
I, I believe there are some examples where people have slid on carbon materials and they get graphite, like they do get layers and ordered uh, graphitic uh, like structures under certain conditions. Uh, I haven't studied that myself. I, I'm not uh, remembering who, where that's been seen, um, but uh, I think that uh, if you if you can make that happen, I would expect that you would have low friction. It, it, it should be it should it should give you low friction if you have um, you know low enough applied forces. Um, but that all being said, uh, the this rehybridization to form sp two on the surface of diamond on the surface of DLCs that also gives low friction. Okay, the the sp two does not need to be ordered. It doesn't need to be layered and crystalline like graphite um, to give you low friction. You just, uh, as if you have a soft sp2 layer and, uh, and you need to have some hydrogen around to prevent bonds from forming across the interface, other, other passivating species like water, then you get very low friction. And, and it has nothing to do with graphene or graphite. Um, uh, it's, it's that the sp2 itself is supporting the load and and is smooth and is not bonding across the interface. Okay, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Um, okay, so I think we're gonna switch to the, to the next uh, question. I see a raised hand by Dip Das, I hope I pronounced the name correctly. Yes, uh, am I audible? Yes. Thank you, Professor Robert, for such a nice talk. Uh, so you. Uh, as you know, the MOS2 and, and this sort of transition metal dichalcogenides are very sensitive to strain. So uh, is there any possibility while you are loading with different pressures so uh, their strain A got induced and accordingly their local conduction changes because uh, in that case uh, for local conducting atomic force microscopy uh, could give you a good uh, contrast effect. Yeah, yeah, I, a very good question. You know, the uh, local, the stresses and, and thus the strains can be quite high under this very small AFM tip. Um, if you have the layer, you know, supported on a substrate, uh, then um, you're compressing. If it's a if it's a suspended membrane, actually, you know, you'll be pushing down that membrane, and you can stretch it into uh, and get quite a bit of tension there. So uh, we haven't looked at that, but I have seen a couple papers where other groups have reported that. Uh, the forces applied by the tip can induce changes in the electrical properties. And particularly, there's this 2H to 1T uh, transformation that can occur in these TMDs. And yeah. I just recently saw a paper, I'm not sure how recent the paper is, I found it recently, I think it's within the last couple of years, where someone reported using the tip and getting that phase transformation and recording the expected change in conductivity. Um, and so I don't recall which group that was, but it looked like a very nice uh, very nice piece of work. So you can do that. And I think that that's, uh, um, yeah, a forefront area. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Welcome. And how that would change friction would be a great question. <laughs> you know, you get a phase transition that ought to change the potential energy surface and potentially the mechanical behavior and the lattice constant a lot. So I think this would be an exciting thing to try to measure. Uh, Especially for uh, the 1T and uh, 2H phase transitions. So accordingly, their local potential curve is also will also change uh, as yep. far my understanding. Yep, agreed. And that can also be mimicked from uh, SKPM and this, the potential yep. mapping. Yep, yep. Thank agreed. you. You're welcome. Uh, there's another question by Sarah Golamband. If you want to ask a question. Um, hello. Hello. Uh, hi, Rob. I, thanks very much for the interesting talk. You can hear me properly? Yes, yes. Thank you. Yeah. Um, actually, that's, um, um, this is just a comment. I, I noticed that's very interesting um, uh, 
point about exactly in the same slide you have, we see now MOS2, MOX, actually MOX2 um, comparison. Uh, yeah. Because I, I exactly saw the same trend on the electrocatalytic activity, hydrogen evolution. When mm -hmm. I was working with Jonathan Coleman and, and in this project, mm -hmm. we had a lot of 2D materials. Uh, we, I have compared MOX2 with WX2, exactly uh, uh, sulfur, selenium, and telluride uh, compounds. Mm -hmm. And um, so the friction force, you say the friction is larger for MOS2 and then um, goes, um, um, you know, get a smaller to T2. The exactly the opposite um, direction goes for electrocatalytic activity. Okay. Um, so yes. MOT2 is the most active and then MOS2 and MOT2. And I even saw um, by observation that the, the rate of hydrogen um, is, um, it, uh, when it, it bubbles and, and uh, sticks to the surface uh, in the case of MOS2, and MOT2 is just um, continuously grows and it doesn't stick. It's, it's like so, sort of friction that also I think affects the rate uh, that hydrogen uh, moves on the surface until it goes off the surface. So it's very interesting point um, uh, to see that um, the friction also may play a role. I don't know, but I think it, yeah. it's a it's nice idea to have a look at uh, the correlation between this, the friction and also the, the catalytic activity. Yeah, yeah. I, I wonder, you know, I, with those electric catalytic activity, they would have additional, um, you know, effects from just the different uh, Electron densities and and um, electronic behavior and properties of these of these uh, different yeah. materials, but it reminds me there was something I actually meant to say and didn't say, which is that although we saw this friction trend um, with with uh, decreasing friction as we go to larger uh, mm -hmm. chalcogens, um, there is some simulation work from Clelia Righi's group um, in in Modena, Italy, where she did simulations of not tip on layer, but layer on layer sliding. And they looked at MOS2, MOS2, and then MOSE2 layer on layer, MOTE2 layer on layer. And they actually saw the opposite trend as well, what we saw. Um, they saw that for the self-mated interactions of layer on layer, um, they got higher friction as you go from sulfur to selenium to tellurium. And I believe that in their case, um, they associate with that they associated that with the fact that there is a, I, I, I brushed off the difference in potential energy surface, but th there is a small difference. The, the telluride does have a slightly, a somewhat a slightly higher corrugation than the selenide, which is a slightly higher corrugation than the sulfur. And, and that when it's layer on layer, you don't get to take advantage of this uh, um, saddle uh, effect in the same way that you do with a tip. Um, and, and so in their case, the friction contrast inverted. Um, so tip on layer has a different trend than layer on layer. Um, so uh, uh, there's an interplay there between corrugation, uh, lattice constant, and, and perhaps the mechanics and the stiffness. And so, yeah. you know, just some food for thought. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I see. I see a question in the chat um, on uh, a general question: uh, How is lateral stiffness associated with contact area in an AFM tip? Um, and um, according to continuum mechanics, and actually, I'll shamelessly advertise: uh, we we cover this in the book that continuum mechanics predicts that the contact stiffness goes up with the contact radius, okay? So normally the square root of the contact area. Now that changes somewhat if you have adhesion, but of course, more area, more stiffness. Um, and then atomistically, um, there are some interesting effects and Mark Robbins had some nice simulations where they showed that can happen, but it depends on the, the structure, the, rel the structure of the tip and sample. So commensurate versus incommensurate, amorphous versus crystalline. 
And you can sometimes see rather anomalously low lateral stiffnesses if you don't have good interfacial contact. It can be kind of a rather uh, compliant interface. Um, so the short answer is uh, it goes up with, with the contact radius according to continuum mechanics, but um, uh, things can, you have to really look carefully uh, to understand what's happening on for nanoscale contacts. I hope that answered your question, Himachu. I think there's one last question in the chat, Rob. Right. About the Which friction dependence you... oh. for structural disorder on graphene. Ah, okay. We have not looked at that. Um, so we, yeah, we took advantage of the fact that graphene has so few defects and we sort of avoided them and, 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 and didn't look carefully for them. There is some other work where, where people have looked at uh, friction contrast um, well, let me go back a step. Phil, actually, Egberts did look at what happens when you have steps. So that's one type of defect. And there is friction enhancement at steps um, because those are higher energy sites um, and you can get deformation uh, and even folding up at those steps. Um, but uh, I'm, in terms of, you probably think about point defects or maybe, maybe grain boundaries. Um, uh, there is, um, those tend to increase friction. And I believe it was Tobin Filter's group in Toronto has, has looked at um, uh, disorder, uh, disordering effects. And um, the, uh, 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 the short answer is that, you know, disorder can lead to out of plane deformation, so roughness. It can lead to um, higher local energy uh, at the defect sites. And, and that it, it would tend to increase um, friction. And Phil's commenting, there's some good Prandtl Tomlinson with temperature simulations on the infective disorder and defects in graphene. Ah, okay, there, that sounds good. Um, uh, that, that sounds highly relevant to that question. Phil, uh, can you chime in on whose work that was? I need to go and look for it in my computer, but I remember reading it for something, some literature yeah. review, so. Sure, yeah, I'm not remembering, but I, that rings a bell, so great. Excellent. So um, I think it's, it's time to also close this webinar because we also don't want to, to take too much of your time, Rob. Um, thank you yep. very much for the very extensive uh, discussion, um, uh, for taking the time for that. I think all the audience appreciated it quite a lot. So in this sense, I would like to thank you for your very nice talk, for the discussion. Um, also special thanks go to all the sponsors, uh, the MDPI journals, coatings and lubricants, uh, frontiers in uh, mechanical engineering, uh, and as well the industrial sponsor from Artec Instruments in California. So thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, in March, we're gonna come back uh, to a Maxine related uh, workshop uh, given by Baba Ganasuri, the former postdoc of Yuri Gogotzi. And then, uh, but we're going to send all the announcement uh, very soon. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much, Rob. Thanks, everybody, for joining. And uh, we'll see you for the next one. Thank you. Have a great day. Take care. Bye-bye. Take, Take care. Bye-bye. We also invite you to submit your research to three current special issues in coatings, lubricants, or frontiers in mechanical engineering. You can find the links to the special issues in the comment section below the video. Introducing the most advanced universal tribometer, the MFT 5000. With a modular architecture platform design, it is a robust surface testing instrument engineered to evaluate friction, wear, mechanical properties of materials, as well as lubricants over time. The mft 5000s open XYZ stages and wide range of interchangeable modules and sensors allows users to self-implement and add on customization and combine several tribology tools all on one device. These diverse modules accomplish various motions for any application and are capable of speeds from 10,000 RPM to 500 Hz oscillation. The complement sensors achieve millinewton to 12,000 newton wide force range 
with options of strain gauge, piezo, and capacitive multi-dimension force sensors. The Lambda profilometer, combined with the patented inline design, coincide to analyze any surface, including glass, with ease. Because of its unique four imaging modes, the profilometer produces 3D information by creating sub-nanometer surface images automatically. A fully automated and simple software interface integrates the data, enabling researchers to design and conduct tests at nano, micro, and macro levels. To simulate real-life scenarios, the tribometer comes with several environmental control options that allows testing minus 120 to 1200 degrees Celsius temperatures. These interchangeable chambers are skilled in evaluating high pressure, vacuum, humidity, salt spray, and tribo-corrosion conditions. Due to its multiple possible configurations, the MFT-5000 is used extensively across a wide range of industries including oil, biomedical, semiconductor, coatings, automotive, electronics, materials, aerospace, and many more. On this platform, all types of tribology tests are possible. Our tech instruments, leading innovation in tribology and surface test instrumentation.